morning we're going to look at them from Bible, uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. We've got Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. It goes, But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be the first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Am I echoing? <laughs> okay. Is it something I can do or something you need to do? <laughs> I sound good, though. <laughs> I love this sound, but I'm hearing things. Okay, it's better? Is it good? Okay, good. So, let me ask this question. Are you a Christian? Of course. I'm sure most of you, if not all, probably look at me and say, what kind of question is that? Of course we are Christians. No, let me ask you the other question then. Are you a minister of Jesus Christ? Are you a minister of Jesus Christ? You might say, wait a minute, I am not a pastor. Well, I didn't ask you whether you're a pastor. I asked you whether you are a minister of Jesus Christ. Long time ago, in an old uh, NHC days, uh, we used to give away a small gift to uh, people who come and uh, become a new member. Uh, when they finished the uh, first class, which is the new membership class, we give them a little pen uh, saying, welcome to the family of Jesus Christ. And then when they complete the whole series of this study, that we gave a clerk, it says, a minister of Jesus Christ. Because that is what the journey of our life as a Christian is all about. We come together to become a family. So as you know, we are talking about the vision series, right? And then when we come together as a family, then we worship Jesus together as a family. Remember, I keep on saying as a family because we are not strangers, right? I hope not. Or we are not even neighbors. We're not even friends. We are a family. Say it with me. We are a family. I hope you believe that. And that is why we call each other a brother and sister or sister in Christ, right? So when we come together, that we should worship Jesus. And then when we worship Jesus together, then we should grow together, right? And that is why Pastor Jonathan Parker uh, explained the last Sunday and challenged us that how we should grow through the Word of God. And that is the reason that we have many small groups, that we have like Bible study on Sunday morning, a small group, and then we have weekday small groups, and we have discipleship classes. Why do we have all these classes on small groups? So we can learn from Bible, and we can grow together. We can become mature and more like Christ. Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to grow? So we can complete the mission that Jesus gave us. That is the build up the His body. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 says this, And he put all things under his feet and gave him as a head over all things to the church, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So church is the body of Christ, and we are a part of his body. So when we say that we are a family, that means we are part of Jesus' body. And that we are getting together to worship Jesus, to grow together, so we can build up the body of Christ together, right? And how can we build up the body of Christ? By serving one another. So today's the sermon title is very simple. What is that? Let's serve. Say it with me. Let's serve. I hope you can go around and tell people today, let's serve. Let's serve. Or you can say, let me serve. Why do we need to serve? I mentioned that we need to grow and build up the body of Christ together. But the three reasons that Jesus came to serve. Jesus commanded us to serve. And then thirdly, Jesus will be pleased when we serve. It's all about Jesus Christ, right? So first is that Jesus came to serve. Now, today's story. 
I just read the book of Matthew chapter 20, is starting with the mother of James and John visiting Jesus Christ. 20, verse 20, chapter 20, verse 20, start with this. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee that came to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And Jesus asked her, what do you want? And the mother of James and John are telling Jesus that I want my sons to sit in right hand of yours and left hand of yours in your kingdom. And that was good though, right? Because she believed the kingdom of Jesus Christ. She learned, she believed, but the problem was that she was still a very selfish mom who only cared for her sons. Now, after Jesus like, corrected her, explained to her how ignorant she was, and then today's verse starts. Verse 25, we just read that, right? Jesus called them, well, this, these are the disciples, the rest of the disciples who were really upset with James and John and, and their mother, like, what are you talking about, right? And said, you know that the rulers of Gentiles lord it over them, and then their great ones exercise authority over them. And the whole world, the okay, main thing the people are trying to do is ruling over other people. This is the ultimate goal of so many people. This is a definition of being success, the ruling over other people. Verse 6 says, It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Now, this is a paradox of the kingdom of God, right? The first to become the last, and last will become first. If you focus on this whole world, you're not going to understand this logic. Like, I don't understand what does that mean, right? It's, to us, it's not a paradox, but there's the kingdom of God. And then verse 27, whoever would be the first among you must be your slave, meaning servants. And then verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus clearly said, to his disciples and the crowd and the whole world, he came to serve and eventually die for all of us. Now, if Jesus came to serve, what should we do? <laughs> How many parents teach children, your children says, you are born to serve? When your kids are young, say, you are born to serve. I don't know whether any parents are teaching them. No, parents are teaching them that I want you to be the best. I want you to be the highest. I want you to be the, like the greatest in a way. I want you to be the first. This is what we teach them. And then when you come to church and they learn from the Bible and it's totally opposite. And I guess that's why we have so many confused Christians. Like, this is one thing that parents or a whole world or the, by, uh, the school teaches. And then there's the other thing that the Bible teaches the totally opposite. You know what? No, Jesus asks us to be our best. Jesus asked us to be the best server ever. You know, Jesus was the most amazing and awesome server ever lived. He called his disciples to teach them and meet their needs, emotional needs, financial needs, physical needs, any needs they have, Jesus actually provided to them and eventually gave his life for them and for all of us. I mean, he was the greatest server ever. He came to serve God by serving people. He came to serve God by serving people. Are you born to serve God? By serving people. And I hope that we have that conviction. I am, or I was born to God, and born to God to, I am born to serve God, sorry, by serving others. We are called to serve God by serving others. See, we are gathering together to worship Jesus Christ and grow together like Jesus Christ and then serve like Jesus Christ. So we should serve Jesus by serving others, other family members in this church and then around us, neighbors, serving them because Jesus came to serve. And the second thing is that Jesus commanded us to serve. He did not just come to serve people, but he asked, he commanded us disciples to serve. When it was time for Jesus to leave his disciples, it was time for him to die on the cross for them. 
And when they were having dinner together, the last Passover dinner, then Jesus stood up while they were eating dinner, and he washed disciples' feet. This is what John chapter 13, verse 13 says. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Verse 15, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now, Jesus not only said that he came to serve, but he showed them how to serve and commanded them to serve each other that way. Why did you do that? When we serve others, it's not only for others, but it's for us too. When you serve others, it's for you too. There's a benefit when you serve other people. The three benefits I can tell you, the first one is our service will increase our value, our service will increase our joy, and our service will increase our reward. Now, our service will increase our value, the value of your life, your being. We'll be made more valuable to God and to others when we serve. Now, I don't know whether you thought about it. Can God count on me? Can God count on you? Can other people count on you? So more people can count on you that you're more valuable to all those more people, right? Your value will depending on that your service to others. So when you serve others, it's not only serving others so for other people, for yourself, that your value will increase. And then also your joy will increase. When you serve others, when you help other people, then you'll be more joyful now. No matter how much I say this, only those people who actually experience it will recognize this value. That when you help others and they can the help, the person that you help is really better, wiser, happier, then your joy will be so great. If ever help other people or serve other people, I'm sure you experience that, right? I love to teach. I love to show them what to things that I know how. Sometimes, what well, I don't know how, but I want to show them anyway. And when I watch them, the better because of what I try to help them, that joy comes to me is, is better than anything. And I hope we all can experience that joy. Right? So when we serve, our service will increase our value, our service will increase our joy, and then our service will increase our reward because God's reward for you and me, depending on how valuable we are for Him, for others. That is why John chapter 13, verse 17, I just read, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus washed disciples' feet, and there was a job for the lowest servant at the time. While they're eating dinner, who would like to do that? Nobody wants to do it, but Jesus did it. And he was telling them. Now, he says that this is about time for him to leave these disciples. This is almost the last teaching moment Jesus had for them. Jesus taught them for three years. They got together. They got to know Jesus. They spent time. They learned so much knowledge from Jesus, experiencing him. And to the end, the last one that Jesus wanted them to know, he said, how they could serve one another. And then he says, this is how you should. I'm going to wash your feet. That's the nasty thing. And when you eat dinner, nobody wants to do that. I will do it for you. So you can do for each other. And when you do it, then you will be blessed, he said. He didn't say when you serve others, you will suffer. He didn't say when you serve others, you will be inconvenient. No, you will be blessed because your reward will depend on what you do. Right? So Jesus came to serve. Jesus commanded to serve. And that is the reason we need to serve. And the third reason is that Jesus will be pleased when we serve. 
Now, John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandment. If you love me, you will keep my commandment. If you change that one, if you keep my commandment, I will be happier. If you listen to me and obey what I tell you, then I will be happier. If you serve others like you, I served you, then I will be happier. The reason we serve, we should serve each other is because Jesus will be pleased when I serve God by serving others. When I serve God by serving others, Jesus will be pleased because that was Jesus' ministry. He came to help people. He came to serve God by serving others. That was his ministry, and that should be our ministry. So when you come to church and say, oh, I need to serve other people, we don't really call that serve. We call that ministry, right? When we face Jesus Christ, one day, do you think Jesus is going to ask you, like, oh, let me ask you this question. What church did you attend? What was the name of the church did you attend? I don't think he cares for that. I'm pretty sure, but he would like to know what we did at the church that we attended. So Jesus would ask you this question. I'm imagining, but I'm pretty sure he would say, oh, so what did you do there? What did you do at that church you attend, that you used to attend, you used to belong because it doesn't matter which church you attend, as long as they teach right theology, I'm sure. But the more important part is what did you do there? See, when you tell people like, oh, yeah, guess what? I'm attending JBC. That's not as important. Then you know what? I do this at JBC. That is my ministry at JBC, right? I'm not just attending JBC. I am a minister at JBC. So say with me, I am a minister at JBC. I hope you say that to people. I hope you tell you your neighbors and your friends, oh yeah, yeah, I attend the JBC. What does that mean? No, I'm a minister at JBC because we are all, and you all, are ministers of Jesus Christ. If somebody asks you, how many ministers at JBC? Please don't tell them, oh, four. We have four fat pastors. You have to tell them how many? How many? About 100. Now, if you tell them, most people are going to say, wow, your church must be great, big, huge, 100 ministers, because they don't understand the concept. No, we all are ministers. Every one of us are ministers at JBC because I have a ministry at JBC. The reason that all of us are ministers at JBC because all of us should have a ministry at JBC. See, we are not cast. We are the host. Some people attend the church for the rest of so many years of their lives, and they're always a guest. Always. Some people go to church, and then two days later, they will become the host. Like, oh, yeah. I don't know why. I think I have a tendency to do that when I was young. Like when I became a Christian and attended church. And I act like I always am a host. And some people didn't like it. They told me afterwards when I was in Virginia Tech. Okay? I didn't just talk to one person, two people. I went around and talking to so many different people. Especially people who are like standing by themselves. This is my antenna. When I see people, my antenna goes up. And if you sitting by, by yourself, guarantee I'm going to go to you. If I see people together, two, three people talking, don't bother because they have friends, family, whoever. But if they're alone, we shouldn't have any kind of people like that. Now, sometimes they might want to be, so it's fine, it's okay. But if that happens, even though you don't want to be, then somebody needs to go. And that was my antenna. So I went around talking to people. After service, every time we get together at Virginia Tech, they all look at me and say, who is that guy? And then they told me later. That's why I found that out. You know, when I saw you first time, I didn't like you. Because you act like you own the place. You went out and talking to all these people. I didn't like that. We're just standing small crowd, the corner and talking to our friends, and then we go home. This is what we do. I didn't know why, and I still don't know why. God gave me that. 
when you come to area that I am, I'm trying. I'm going to try my best to for you to feel comfortable because I am the host. Say it with me. I am the host. So don't say I am and stop because that's who God is, right? <laughs> I am the host. We are the host. The church, which is full of a host, don't you think God would bless them? The church is full of guests. Do you think God would be pleased? Because it is our privilege and our responsibility to build up this family of Christ, the body of Christ. Okay. Everyone should have something at their church, right? When we say, oh, let's do something to build up this family, and then people might say, oh, isn't some, we have the pastor to do that? No, it's everyone's job. If all of us' job, because we are our ministers. So, to build up this family, like one year anniversary, we got together. Even though the, the JBC has like, I forgot, 270? Whatever the years, I know you might not know they don't. So many years, 280 years of history, whatever, okay? It's almost like we are starting again. It's a new church, family, together, right? So we are trying to start an even different ministry here, right? To make it stronger, to make us better. Like, as you know, that we have music ministry going on all the time, right? People are serving, and, uh, and then music ministry, we have youth and college groups meeting all the time. And then we just started children's ministry, on Sundays, and I'm sure the children's ministry people are going to ask people to help, and they come on, let's do it together. And I'm going to show some of the ministry, the teams that we are going to introduce. It's not that brand new. We might have already, but we're not having like formalized per se. Okay, it says like um, man, women's ministry and the men's ministry, hospitality ministry, greeter ministry, outreach ministry. No? There's so much, probably a lot more ministry that we suppose we should be able to do it together. That all the ministry means that we all get together and that we serve one another in different capacity. Right? Who's supposed to be in men's ministry? Are you men? Are you confused with yourself? <laughs> Who's supposed to be in the women's ministry? Any women? Right? I know young kids say, am I old enough to be a woman? Well, if you are old enough to ask that question, yes, you're old enough. <laughs> right? I mean, all different kinds of ministry that we're going to try to build together. And the only way it's going to work is when people come and serve each other and give ideas, different ideas. I hope every one of us belong to at least one of those ministry teams. I hope this is something, oh, Pastor Jonathan's doing, or somebody else's doing. No, this is not somebody else's thing. It's your thing. It's our thing. It's a family thing. So when something is going on family, you should get involved, right? So, well, those small groups, we invite people. Like, come on, come on. You know, we don't have to tell our family members, say, come on. Everyone should belong to at least one of those groups. Get to know. And everyone should belong to at least one of this ministry to get, to get involved and to work together. Now, I've heard some church have some bike ministry. Like, what is bike ministry? Oh, we love to ride bike. And we just take trip to a couple, three days. And we go together and we share our life. We share a message. We encourage one another. And we pour out our hearts and we pray one to one another. I mean, oh, yeah, we have backpacking. I don't like bike, but I like hiking. You know? Some churches have that kind of ministry going on. I was invited to one of the church ministry, men's group ministry, a uh, church around in this area. And uh, there was a men's night out at shooting range. I'm not a shooter. <laughs> I don't own guns. But they got together. And then everybody brought different kinds of guns. It was fun because they visited the whole place and every different guns out there. And they said, can I borrow? Sure, sure. They are friends, family. Okay. And then we just shoot. And then they go to a small room, and they'll share a message. 
for me, it was a little strange. After you're shooting, <laughs> and then you go to and share the love of God. I mean, but so to some people, that's a hobby, right? At our church, every Tuesday, there's a many young men got together, young adults got together and played basketball for like about, I don't know, half a year so far and continue more. And there's a great time to get to know, have fun together, sweat together, you know, encourage one another, and great time to invite your friends. Years ago, uh, we used to uh, prepare a meal for homeless shelter every month. And um, it was a great time. We stopped after a while, but every time we prepare a meal and they bring them to the homeless shelter, it was party going on there because they knew the food we provided was really good. They had been waiting for it. And then we spent time together with the people at homeless shelter. And people at homeless shelter is nothing different than you or me. They are vice president. They are a business owner. Day before, week before, just something happened to them. And they just become homeless. Open your eyes. There are many people around you at our church, JBC, and our neighbors whom they need our reach, our help. That God is calling us to have that ministry. How can you get involved in these ministries? That you got to find your gift, discover your gift, and be able to develop it. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, As each has a, received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So God gave each and every one of us, according to His grace, some kind of gift. No one has all the gifts. No one has no gifts. I'm saying again, no one has all the gifts, and no one has no gifts. So nobody can tell me, say, I'm sorry, I don't have that gift. No, you have some gift. The reason we call the gift is because you're using that for God's glory, to build up God's household, the body of Christ. If you use that as for your own sake, we're going to call that talent. But it's not talent. It's a gift. So we can use to serve God by serving others. Now, there are some examples of the spiritual gifts in the Bible. And we're not going to go through all that. But I'm going to read some of the examples here. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 through like 8. Some examples. Says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. Of course, we are all different. And so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one of the another, having gifts that differ, uh, differ according to the grace given to us, so let us use them. If prophecy in portion to our faith, if service in our serving, in the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his, in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does act of mercy with cheerfulness, and so on, right? Now, this is not full list. The Paul is not writing full list of gifts because there's tons more, hundreds more different gifts out there. He just gave some examples, pretty good ones, important ones. But there's a lot more gifts that we can have, and we do have. See, anything you can do to build up the body of Christ can be considered as a gift. See, picking up the trash can be a gift. Do you agree? Picking up the trash can be a gift. You know why it's a gift? Because people who don't have that gift don't even see that trash. I mean, I can just walk by trash. That's my mom. mom, uh, my, mom. my wife always tells me, how can you walk by this? Because I didn't see it. Are you blind? Yes, I am. <laughs> of course, I didn't see it. People are asking me, Pastor, Pastor, can we do this? Yes. Okay, you're in charge. What do you mean? What do you mean I'm in charge? You're the one who thought about it. You're in charge. Because nobody else saw that. If you come and they give high fives to everybody, that can be your gift. 
I can see some of you guys doing it. Like, high fives every why? Because you want to lift them up. I have some people like that. Every time I see the face, I just get lifted up. Like, wow, I don't know why you're happy, but I am happy because you are happy. Is that person happy all the time? No. But that person has a gift to encourage one another in a way. Even if that person might go through some hardship. See, we all have that spiritual gift. And we have to find that out. Discover them. Because that is your responsibility and our privilege that you need to discover your gift and be able to say, yeah, this is a gift that God gave me. Because why you have to discover? Because you have to develop. And that's our responsibility to respond to Jesus Christ eventually and God himself. This is the gift you gave me and I developed it and now it even become better because I kept on using it. When you use it, it will be better. This is how we can be better, right? Then how can you find your gift? By trying it. I don't think anybody can say, oh, yeah, I have this gift. No, until you try, you're not going to know. You have to try to see whether you can handle it and you can enjoy it, right? Discover and developing of your spiritual gift is our call, right? Now, Pastor uh, Paul Corr just mentioned on a, uh, about made the announcements about our one year anniversary, and then when we have worship together, we want to have kind of joint choir together, and then announcements have been made for a couple of weeks, and then we are planning to have uh, practice not today but next Sunday and Sunday after. So at the last Sunday of the October and first Sunday of November, we only have two Sundays to practice. Now we make announcements. And then I know some people telling me, I say, oh, Pastor, I don't sing. I cannot sing. It doesn't matter. First, this is not a singing competition. Okay. Second, the audience is not people, but God. So you're telling God, says, God, you made me that I don't sing. I cannot sing. No. It's not a matter of whether you can sing or not. It's not a matter of whether you care to sing or not. It's a matter of whether you have a heart to serve or not. So the question that we should ask is, each other said, what can I do? And some of you might enjoy it, even though you might not be able to sing well. Like, oh, I didn't know. I heard that many times too from people like, until I tried, I never knew I could enjoy that. When I tried it, like, I didn't like it at first, but after I tried, like, wow, I didn't know I can. And I didn't know I could enjoy it. I never knew I could speak two languages at the same time until I tried. Remember years ago when, uh, not remember, I'm sorry, but years ago when we had to, I would decide to have the bilingual service. And it was the first time ever in my life I have to speak English and Korean, and I cannot speak either one. How in the world I can do both, back and forth? I practiced, practiced, but I didn't know how I could do that. But God told me, us, you need that now for your church, for the body of Christ. Do it. So I try. I'm sure in the beginning I wasn't that good, but I got used to it. It wasn't that hard after all. Oh, I can speak two languages back to back. I didn't know my brain is working that way. I didn't know how I could speak one language and think about the other language. At the same time, looking at somebody says, why is he crying? Why is he sleeping? I could think about all at the same time. I'm like, whoa. Until I tried. I would never know. Same thing. If you have a heart to serve, then you're going to ask that question, what can I do? And I hope, really hope, that all of us are going to ask this question to each other. Whenever you hear about something going on at church, the first question and only question is, what can I do? I don't know whether I can do it or not, but let me know, what can I do? You know, somebody says to me, like, oh, pastor, I'm volunteering in my church. And I said, that's oxymoron. 
you're volunteering at your church. Sounds like you're volunteering in your own home. You can say, oh, I volunteer at my friend's church because you don't belong there. We don't volunteer at our own church because this is your church, your home, your family. Then you don't volunteer because you are the host. Right? So first question is very important. Is this my family? Is this church my family? Very critical. Is this church my family? And then once you say, yes, it is my family, then there's no volunteering. Because this is your job or your life. Well, hopefully your joy. What can I do to build up this family? I better not tell my wife when she's working hard, say, can I volunteer something? She will smack me. But I'll ask her, honey, what can I do? Because I'm not sure what I can do yet. So I hope we all can say that to each other. I hope that we're all excited to be involved in one of those ministry teams. We haven't decided exactly what each ministry team will do yet because people who belong and leading that ministry team will decide. You can do one, you can do ten. Totally matter of how dedicated we are and how excited to see that grow together. I hope that we all can say to each other, like, I cannot wait to see all these ministry teams going on and get excited about what we do as church and then bring even more ideas on different ministry teams because Jesus will be pleased to see that. Do we have a dream? Are you dreaming? <laughs> Do you have a dream? You know, it's not just Martin Luther King Jr. can say, I have a dream speech. I have a dream. I have a dream that the JBC one day will be filled with people with a heart to serve. That's my dream. So I don't think we are there yet. I don't know any church is there yet. But I hope everyone who belongs to J.P.'s family will have heart to serve. Serve God by serving others. Do you have that dream? I hope you do. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for our gathering, our worship, our presence in this place. We are here because of you. We have a relationship with one another because of you. We exist in this world because of you. And we can, we can get really excited because of you. Father God, guide us, teach us, encourage us, empower us. And give us excitement to serve you by serving others. We are church, the body of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that this body will grow together, getting stronger, more mature, more like Christ. The people outside of this body will join us with gladness. Thank you, Lord God, for calling us as a children. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.